Welcome to the Money in Banking video series. What makes an economy vulnerable to a financial crisis? How can a small shock trigger a large-scale crisis? How to manage a crisis? How to prevent it? And who should be in charge of it? In this video series, you will learn about money creation by banks, liquidity spirals and the debt disinflation spiral, as well as the paradox of prudence. You will study macropotential policy and monetary policy, contrasting the money view with the credit view. You will become familiar with monetary dominance, fiscal dominance and financial dominance. In addition, you will be exposed to various stability concepts and to the diabolic or doom loop between banking and sovereign risk. This video series is based on two articles I wrote with Yuli Sanikov titled The I Theory of Money and Redistributive Monetary Policy. Our research sheds new light on these questions and studies the interaction between monetary policy, financial regulation and fiscal policy. Part one of this video series studies how the financial sector works. Let's start by setting up a simple economy with the financial sector. In our simple economy, there's a bank and someone we call end borrower, who might want to buy a house. He goes to the bank and takes out a mortgage, let's say a million dollars. The bank which grants him a mortgage will credit the end borrower one million dollars as deposit as soon as the mortgage is agreed upon. This creates credit on the asset side of the bank's balance sheet and deposit on the liability side of the bank's balance sheet. When the end borrower finally buys a house and makes a payment to the seller, he transfers his deposit to the seller of the house. As long as the seller holds a deposit, he essentially, through the bank, lends funds to the end borrower. Notice that after the purchase of the house, the credit, the mortgage to the end borrower, is risky to the bank, while the saver's deposit is supposedly risk-free. Second, the mortgage is a long-term commitment to the bank, while the saver's deposits are short-term. For these reasons, the bank faces two risks. First, on the asset side, there's the possibility that the end borrower does not pay back his debt. The bank faces credit or default risk, represented graphically by the fluctuating curve. Second, the bank faces liquidity funding risk or run risk, which stems from the fact that the credit is long-term while the deposits are short-term. If suddenly all savers withdraw their deposits, the bank will not be able to repay them. In order to cover default risk, the bank should have an equity cushion to protect the depositors, savers in our example. In order to fend off liquidity run risk, some of these funds are invested in safe assets, for example, reserves. The bank's balance sheet now has reserves on the asset side, in addition to credit. On the liability side, it has the equity of the bank, in addition to savers' own deposits, IOUs against the bank. Of course, the bank has many end borrowers on the asset side and many savers' deposit holders on the liability side. Granted, these risky loans to the end borrowers do not default all at the same time. The risks of each end borrowers partially offset each other. The bank diversifies risk across various end borrowers. When putting various credits together into a single portfolio, which is like merging the fluctuating curves into a single one, fluctuations are largely averaged out. Also, notice that although the bank grants many forms of credit, the bank issues standardized IOUs in form of deposits. So on the asset side, there are long-term assets which are risky and illiquid, while on the liability side, there are standardized deposits, IOUs, issued by the bank. The latter, which are much more liquid. In a sense, liquid deposits are one of the outputs of the bank's production function. These standardized deposits, IOUs, are inside money that is created by the banking sector. Since they are short-term, they are readily available. Due to the protection from the equity of the bank, the default probabilities are low. 
that is, credit risk is limited. Hence, there's little asymmetric information about the value of these IOUs. Because of this, it is easy to net IOUs across the whole financial system, and hence it serves as a means of payment. Now, let's add the government with the central bank. The reserves that we have introduced earlier on the asset side of the bank's balance sheet are provided by the government, more precisely by the central bank. Putting the picture together with the banks, we can now see that savers have the option to hold either inside money in the form of standardized deposits, IOUs, or outside money in form of physical cash issued by the central bank. In addition, savers can also directly lend to end borrowers. However, direct lending is more risky for two reasons. First, savers cannot diversify as well as banks. Second, banks are better at enforcing repayment from end borrowers. Therefore, direct lending is much more risky compared to holding inside money. In addition, as mentioned before, standardization of inside money allows some netting, which is not the case for direct lending claims, since the default risk might differ from end borrower to end borrower. To sum up, part one of this video series illustrated how the banks create money in normal times. In part two, we study how the financial economy copes with an adverse shock. We focus on two spirals, the liquidity spiral and the disinflation spiral. We will also introduce the paradox of prudence. Click on part two for the next video.